Welcome to this predicted paper from OnMaths that is based on the advanced information given to us by the exam boards. Please use this paper in addition to your other revision. You can complete a unique version of this paper by going to our OnMaths site. OnMaths is full of free content to help you prepare for your exams, such as topic-based papers, demon questions and mini-mocks. If you like what we do, please consider subscribing. So the first thing we're going to do is write this as a ratio between the fractions. So we're going to have um, green to black. Now it says that um, a quarter of the counters are black. And therefore the remaining counters will be green. So if a quarter are black, that leaves three quarters to be green. And what we can do here is on both sides of the ratio, all I'm going to do is just times it by four. So I'm just going to times four both sides. So three divided by four times four, because over four just means divided by four. So three divided by four times by four just gets rid of the fraction. And one divided by four times four is just going to be one. Now, this might surprise some people because they will probably think it's a ratio of four to one, but we can show here that it's a ratio of three to one. Here we're given a triangle, and we're not actually given um, the values of each of the angles. We're given them in terms of x, but we know that they're going to add up to 180. So we're going to do the 20x plus the 2x plus the 23x, and we know that it's going to equal 180. And the reason is that its angles in a triangle add up to 180. Okay, let's get our tram lines in, because we've got algebra and we're solving here going to put our tram lines in. Now on the left hand side we need to add these x terms together. So 2x plus 23x will be 25x plus the 20 will be 45x. And what we're going to do to get x on its own, we're going to divide both sides by 45. So we're going to divide by 45 both sides. And we're going to end up with x equals 4. Instead of doing 0 0.43 times 16, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do 43 times 16. So I'm just going to get rid of the decimal and just change it to 43. But I've got to remember what I've done. So how have I managed to do that? Well, I've times it by 100, and that will be important at the end. And to do 43 times 16, there are loads and loads of different methods. Um, just pick whichever method um, you enjoy doing or that you find easiest. Um, I'm going to do the grid method, uh, but it by no means is the best method. It's just the one I'm choosing to do. So 43 is 43, and 16 is 10 and 6. So 40 times 10 is 400. 40 times 6 is 240. Uh, 10 times 3 is 30. And 3 times 6 is 18. Then I'm just going to add them all together. So 400 plus 240 plus 30 plus 18. And when you add those all together, you get 688. Okay. Now, the problem is that obviously this is not going to equal 688. What we've done, though, is we've times it by 100. So to find the answer, all we need to do is divide this, undo that times by 100, so divide it by 100. When we divide that by 100, we get 6.88. To work out the circumference, we need to first of all work out what the diameter of this is. And to do that, we just draw a line across the circle, and we can see the diameter is twice as big as the radius. So the diameter is going to be the radius times 2, which is 28. Formula for the circumference of a circle is just pi times the diameter, which will be pi times 28. Now to write this in terms of pi, which the question asked for, we just put the number first and then pi. So it will be 28 pi. So to find the um, probability, we're going to do the successful outcomes divided by the total number of outcomes. So looking at this question, it says it 
number of times it should land on a 1. So that would be 1 over the total amount, which is 11. So the chance of us getting a 1 is 1 over 11. To find the expected amount, we do the probability and we times it by the amount of trials. So it says it's spun 60 times, so we times it by 60. And that will give us the answer of 5.454 blah blah blah. Now it can't have landed on a 1 5.4 times. So it's definitely, well, this probability, we always round down. So never ever round up because it's 5 times um, and then a little bit extra. And so only when it gets to 6 can we say that it's 6 times. So the answer to this is just 5. So trying to describe the single transformation, it kind of looks like it could be a rotation, and it would be a rotation of 180 degrees. But if it was a rotation, it would be actually this way around. And so it's not a rotation. It looks to me like it's a reflection, which it is. Now we've got to find out where we put our mirror line. And our mirror line for this would be a horizontal line. So if I if I just guess and I put it down here, notice that B is only one jump away from that, and yet A is one, two, three jumps away from that. So that's not very good. That's not the halfway point. So we need this to be the halfway between the two um, shapes, which is going to be here. And the name of that line, well, everywhere along that line, Y is equal to minus one. So we call it the y equals minus 1 line. So it's going to be a reflection across line y equals minus 1. So in this question, we basically need to add the 2 and 3 quarters and the 2 and 2 fifths. So we're going to do 2 and 3 quarters plus 2 and 2 fifths. Now, if I just rewrite this, 2 and 3 quarters can be written as 2 plus 3 quarters, plus 2 plus 2 and a fifth, or 2 fifths. So we can add the two twos together to make 4, and then all we need to do is add the 3 quarters and the 2 fifths. So when you add uh, two numbers with different denominators, what we need to do is get the common denominators. And we do that by just quickly writing out the 4 and the 5 times table and seeing what the first number in both their times tables is. 16, 20, and 5, 10, 15, 20. So that's 20. So we need to get the um, bottoms of the fractions to 20. Now for 3 quarters, to get the bottom to equal 20, we need to times the 4 by 5. And whatever you do to the bottom, you've got to do to the top. So times that by 5 as well, which will be 15. And for 2 fifths, we'll get that bottom to 20. So we times that by 4. And so we've got times the top by 4 as well to make it 8. So it's going to be 15 over 20 plus 8 over 20. So we need to add the uh, numerators. So it would be 15 plus 8, which is going to be 23 over 20. Now that is a top-heavy fraction, so we can rewrite that as 1 and 3 twentieths. And we can add the 4 and the 1 together to make 5 and 3 twentieths. So the answer is 5 and 3 twentieths. So factorise means to put it into a bracket, and it looks like it's a quadratic here, um, but it's actually just a linear factorising, um, because we don't have a number term. So we're going to just use one bracket for this, and looking at these terms, I'm going to focus first on the numbers. So 20 and 30, I can divide both of those by 10, and that will leave uh, 2 and 3, so that's the numbers done. Next I'm looking at the t terms, so we've got t squared there and a t there. So we can divide out a t 
but that will leave a T on the first term. And finally, I'm going to look at the U. And there's just a U on both of them I can factorise out. And actually, that just leaves nothing on the inside of the bracket. Now, always when you do this, expand the bracket to check if you've made any mistakes. So I'm going to do smiles and rainbows. There's loads of different methods. So 10 times 2 is 20. T times T is T squared. And then the U plus 10 times 3 is 30 times t times u. So we know we've got the right answer. So our answer is 10tu brackets 2t plus 3. We're going to first of all have to convert these both into the same unit. So we've got minutes and hours. But that's not going to help us much. So what I'm going to do is pick the smaller unit, which will be minutes. So I'm going to keep that um, 50 minutes. And I'm going to convert 3 hours into minutes. So that would be 180 because we times by 60. And I'm going to just remove the minutes now. And I can first of all divide by 10. And we want to try and make it nice and simple for ourselves. So divide by 10 would be 5 to 18. And we look at it. Um, 5 and 18, actually there's nothing further we can do with that. So the ratio would be 5 to 18. When translating, we translate with vectors, and the top number in a vector tells us how far right, and the bottom number tells us how far up we go. And to translate a shape, you always pick a point. Now I always pick the top leftmost point, so I'm going to pick this one. And looking at the vector, it says we're going to go two to the right. So we do two jumps to the right, one, two. Now looking at the bottom, because it's minus four, instead of going up four, we're going to go down four. So it would be one, two, three, four. So our new coordinate for the top will be here. And the next thing we need to do is draw in the shape. So that's the top left part of the shape. And so I'm going to draw in the shape. And it's four across. So it should go here. And draw in the shape in there. Make sure that you know that that uh, coordinate is the top left part of our shape. And it says to label it B. So the rules of indices state that if you have a power inside and outside of a bracket, we just multiply them together. So it's 10 to the power of minus 12 times minus 12. Um, two negatives make a positive, and 12 times 12 is 144. So we need to first of all work out the amount of machine minutes it takes to make a toy. And what we do is we multiply the amount of machines by the amount of minutes. So 5 times 40, which would be 200. So if we had one machine, it would take 200 minutes to um, create one toy. Here we asked, well, okay, what if we wanted a, a toy every 8 minutes? So we get the 200, and we divide it by 8. And when we do that, we get 25. So if we had 25 machines, we would be able to make it every 8 minutes. And the logic here is 5 machines. So this is machines, and this is minutes. Is 40. Then, fifth, uh, then 8 minutes think about it we divide that by 5 to get to 8 and so if we divide the amount of minutes by 5 we actually times the amount of machines required by 5 so this is called an inverse relationship so if one doubles the other halves if one divided by 5 the other will times by 5 so our answer here is 25 machines to find the lowest common multiple of two numbers we are going to write out the times tables for each of them so the 6 times table is 6, 12, 18, 24, 30. And we're going to do the 15 times table. So 15 times table is 15, 30. And we can actually stop there because we're looking for the lowest number that is in both times tables. So if we see this 30 is in both times table. So the lowest common multiple of 6 and 15 is 30. To work out the area of a rectangle, we just multiply the width and the length. Um, here they are mixed numbers, so all we do is the width times the length. 
Now when you multiply with fractions, always make them top heavy first, or improper, and to do that you times the big number by the bottom and add it to the top. So we're going to do 1 times 2 and add it to the top, so 3 over 2. Same with this one, 1 times the 3 at the bottom, add it to the top. 1 times 3 is 3, add to the top is 5. Now we've got to get the numerator, oh sorry, we don't need to get the numerator the same, we're multiplying. All we do now, really easily, is just multiply the tops and multiply the bottoms. So we've got to convert 15 over 6 into a mixed number because it asks for a mixed number. So 15, how many 6s go into 15? Well, we're first of all going to uh, have two whole ones. And how many left over? There are going to be three left over. Now, two, uh, 3 over 6 is the same as 1 half because we can divide top and bottom by 3. So our answer is 2 and a half. This looks like it's a really tricky question, and it is a little bit tricky, but it's it's a little bit easier than maybe it looks. Um, the highest common factor is found when you have the prime factors, which we do, of two numbers, and you put them into a Venn diagram, then you can find the um, prime factor, uh, the highest common factor, by multiplying all the numbers in the overlap. So we're going to rewrite these uh, numbers just instead of um, squared, we're just going to write them out. Um, without index form, just makes it a bit easier. And so I'm just removing the squares. And we're going to draw ourselves a Venn diagram. So let's just do a, a rectangle at the outside. And I'm going to try and do some nice circles here. Try my best anyway. Okay, so on the left-hand side, we have the 450. On the right-hand side, we have the 132. So we'll start with the 450. And the numbers, um, so actually looking at the numbers, looking at the um, factors at the top, the prime factors, we can see they both have a 2 in them. So I cross them both out and put 2 in the middle. Uh, we can see they both have a 3 in them. So I cross those 3s out and put a 3 in the middle. And then 450 has a 3, a 5, and a 5. And 132 has the 2 and the 11. So to find the highest common factor, as I said, you multiply all the numbers that are in the middle. And so the highest common factor will be 6. There's a few different methods to find product prime factors, but I prefer using the bubble method. So we put a circle around 75, and we want to split it up into two numbers, so two numbers that multiply together to make it. I always pick the smallest that I can think of, which is normally two, but in this occasion, um, the easiest one for me um, would be five. I think also three goes into it, but five to me seems nice and easy. It doesn't always have to be the smallest that I pick. So 5 times what is 75? Well, 5 times 15 is 75. And then to make 15, we're going to do 3 times 5. And the reason why I've done some of these bubbles in red is that those are the prime factors, which means they, well, they can go, go to 1 and 5, if you do 1, 5, you'll be there all day. So we always stop when we um, do uh, the prime numbers. And so we're going to write these in a list. So 3, 5, and 5. The product means that we put a time sign between them. But if you notice here, we've got 5 times 5. So a different way of writing that in index form is 5 squared. So our answer will be 3 times 5 squared. To find the pressure, we need the area and the force. And we're given the force in the question, and so all we need to do is find out what the area is, which will be the 7 times the 9, which will be 63 centimetres squared. And the um, force is given to us in the question, so what we can do is write down the pressure formula, which says that pressure equals the force divided by the area. Force is given to us as 2268. The area we've calculated is 63. 
divide the two and you get 36. So it's going to be 36 newtons per centimeter squared. When finding a sample of people, you want everyone in the population to have an equal chance of being picked. So in method um, one, um, the facts in a lifestyle magazine might bias the um, people reading it because there's groups of people that don't read lifestyle magazines. Um, a poster up in the gym, again, there's groups of people who don't go to the gym. And um, midday in town centres, well, it might be on a school day or it might be that you are skewing your um, data towards uh, retired people. There's there's lots of reasons why uh, a certain group of people won't be at a town centre at midday. The only one here that gives everyone an equal chance of being picked is this one here. Okay, so picking people randomly from the electoral roll. There are some groups of people who might choose not to be on the electoral roll, but looking at the four methods, um, this one is by far um, the most fair sample. We're going to start by looking at the numerator and the denominator separately. So looking at the numerator first, we've got 9 to the power of 16 times 9 to the power of 46. Now when you have um, two powers of the same base, so they're both 9, base 9, but base is the big number, then what you can do is you can add the indices. So we're going to do 16 plus 46, which is 62, so it's 9 to the power of 62. And looking at the denominator, well, you've got a, a, a power inside and outside the bracket. Whenever you have that, you can just multiply them. So it'd be 9 to the power of 40. Now, whenever you've got a division between two powers of the same base, which we have here, it's 9 to the power of 62 divided by 9 to the power of 40, we just take away the indices. So it'd be 62 take away 40 which will be 9, 9 to the power of 22. So our answer is 9 to the power of 22. There are a few different ways you could answer this question. I'm going to do it with a tree diagram, but you didn't need to draw a tree diagram to answer this question. So we've got our first tree, which is our first bus. And the choices are male and female. And we've got our second kind of branch, I suppose, and it's still male and female, and this is our second bus. So the property of male on a first bus is 9 over 15, and therefore the property of female is 1 minus 9 over 15, which would be 6 over 15. Male on the second bus is 7 over 15. And so female would be 8 over 15, because they need to add up to 1. And it's uh, independent, so these will be the same. And the question is basically asking, what is the probability that both will be female? So to have both female, we need to have gone down this line at the start, and then this line again. Okay, so looking at the fractions along the way, it's 6 over 15 and 8 over 15. The word and in probability means times. So whenever you're finding the probability of getting to an outcome, so this outcome would be FF, because they're both female, you are multiplying the fractions that you go across. So it would be 6 over 15 times 8 over 15. So 6 times 8 is 48. And times the bottoms, uh, 15 times 15 is 225. Now you can actually cancel that down. Um, so what you can do is you can divide top and bottom by 4. And that will give you uh, 16. Uh, is it 4? No. You can divide top and bottom by 3. And that will be 16 over 75. So either 48 over 225 or 16 over 75. We It doesn't look like it, but we actually have a quadratic here. And the reason it doesn't look like it is because we don't have an x term. But as long as we have an x squared term and a number term, we definitely have a quadratic. And notice something about this second number. It's a negative version 
of a square number and that will always be the case because this question is using something called difference of two squares. And it's very very simple to work out. What you do is you put down two sets of brackets and you square root the first term, well that's just going to be x, and you put the positive and negative versions of the square root. So we're going to square root 121 which is 11, so we're going to put plus 11 and minus 11 and that's it. Now when we expand that, and we'll just go quickly expand that now to have a look, it's going to be x squared plus 11x minus 11x minus 121 and notice that the two x terms cancel each other out which is why we don't have the x terms. y is inversely proportional to x means that y is proportional to 1 over x and I'm going to change that for an equal sign by times in the right hand side by k and k represents our constant and we're told that when x is 5 y is 10.8 so I'm going to fill those in, I'm going to substitute those in to be able to find out what k is going to be. So it'll be k over 5. And we're going to be solving this. Let's get my lines in. And solve it, I just times by the bottom of the fraction. So times both sides by 5. And we're going to end up with uh, 50.4 is equal to k. So k is 50.4. I'm going to rewrite this equation here, but we know what k is. It's 50.4. We're asked to find the value of x when y is 9. So we've got 9 equals 50.4 over x. And whenever in this situation here where we've got the unknown at the bottom of a fraction and we've got it equal to a number, what you can do here is actually just swap these around. We're t effectively, we're timesing both sides by x and dividing both sides by 9. But it does really help us out here because it just says that x is equal to 50.4 over 9. We can just do that on the calculator and it gives us 5.6. So to answer this question, you need to just know the answer off by heart. There is a diagram that can help us actually get there. And if we just draw a right angle triangle and put the lengths as 1, not right angle here, we can use Pythagoras, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, to work out the fact that this is going to be root 2. And because it's an isosceles triangle, this angle here is going to be 45 degrees, and same with the bottom right one, but we're not interested in that. When we label it with our marked angle here, we've got the adjacent is here, and the hypotenuse is here. Now we know from um, trigonometry that cos x equals a over h. The angle is going to be cos 45 and a is going to be 1 and h is going to be root 2. Now this is a bit of a, a strange one with 1 over root 2 because we need to actually be able to rationalise the denominator and basically what that means if you haven't done surge yet or you aren't doing thirds, is you times tom bomb by root 2. And so we end up with root 2 over 2. So if you ever see 1 over root 2 is absolutely fine as an answer, but if you ever see the answer as root 2 over 2, the two are actually exactly the same. So writing 1 over root 2 is fine, or writing root 2 over 2 is also correct. So this question is a simultaneous equations question. And so we're going to have to write down some equations. So it says two apples and three pears cost £3.80. So two apples, I'm going to call it A, A for the price of an apple, plus three pears, so 3P, cost £3.80. Now I'm going to do this as 380 just because it's easier to work with integers rather than decimals. And it says three apples, so 3A, plus 8 pairs cost £7.80 or 780 pence. Okay, so the first thing I do is try and get these numbers the same. So 3 and 8, um, they both go into 24. So I need to make them both 24. And what some people do is they just label this A and this B. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to multiply everything in equation A by 8 
so that this becomes 24. So it's going to begin 8a. And so we go times the 2a by 8, which will be 16a plus 24p. And 380 times 8 is 3040. And we're going to do the same with b, but this time we're going to times it by 3. So we have 3b. And we're just going through everything here and we're timesing it by 3. So 9a plus 24p, which is good, that's what we wanted. And 780 times 3 is 2340. So now we've got both of these the same coefficient. What we can do is we can eliminate going downwards. Now, if they are the same, the s in same is the s in subtract. If they were different signs, so if these weren't both positive, if one of them was negative, different, the d in different is the d in add. So here they are the same, so we are going to subtract, and we're going to subtract going downwards. So we're going to start off by doing, and I can just do a little line here to show what we're doing. So we're subtracting going downwards, and we're going to do 16a take away 9a, which will be 7a. 24p take away 24p, which is nothing, which is why we did that, is to eliminate them. And then 3040 take away 2340 will be 700. Then I can put my lines in. And all I need to do now is just divide both sides by 7. And I get A equals 100. So we know that apples cost 100, or one pound. We need to work out what pears cost. So I just need to pick one of the equations. I'm just going to pick this top one here. And I'm going to write it out. Instead of A, we know that A is a pound, or 100 pence. So plus 3P equals 380. So that's going to be 200 plus 3P is 380. And then again, I'm just going to draw my lines down. And we're going to subtract 200 from both sides. So it's going to be 3P equals 180. And then we're going to just divide by 3 both sides. And we've got P equals 60. So a pair costs 60. Now we can check this by using the other equation there. So 3 times 100 is 300, plus 8 lots of 60 is going to be, was that 480? So that's going to be 780, so we know that we've got it right. So the first term will be 50 to the power of 1. Anything to the power of 1 is just itself, so that will just be 50. The next one will be 50 squared, so that's going to be 50 times 50, which will be 5 times 5 times 10 times 10. 25 times 100, which would be 250, uh, 2,500 even. <laughs> and then the last one is 50 cubed. So that's going to be the 2,500 times 50 again. And so when you times that out, you get uh, 125,000. The first thing to notice is we actually have two radii here. So we've got this radius here and this radius here and all radii are always equal in length so we have an isosceles triangle here so this angle here is going to be 19x as well and we've got to write that down so we're going to say angle OBA is equal to 19x and the reason is it's an isosceles triangle Okay, so we know these two are equal. Well, we also can work out x because, as I said before, we have a triangle here, and all angles in a triangle add up to 180. So we've got 7x plus 19x plus 19x equals 180 degrees, and this is angles in a triangle, try and draw a better triangle, equal 180 degrees. Try and write out these reasons in full. Okay, so that's going to be, uh, was it 45x equals 180, and let's get our solving lines in, and we're just going to divide both sides by 45. Okay, so we've got x equals 180 divided by 45, which is 4. 
Now we're looking for this angle here. Uh, that's angle ABC. Now there's a few different ways we could do this. We could work out what this angle is because it's a, a big triangle, etc., etc. Or we can use the fact that we've got a tangent touching a radius. So we know that this, uh, let's just pick a different color, this angle here is 90 degrees. So we can write that down. So angle OBC equals 90 degrees um, because it's uh, the angle between a tangent and a radius. Again, make sure you write all the reasons in full. And so therefore, um, angle ABC, which is what we're asked for, it's just 90 take away the 19x. Well, we know that 19x is 19 times 4, because we know that x is 4. And so that would be 76, so the, in total it would be 14 degrees. So angle ABC is 14 degrees. When asked to simplify a third, and this actually isn't a third until we've simplified it, it means to get rid of, uh, or to get the square root as small as possible. And the way we do that is we write down the factors of the 48 first. So we've got 1 times 48, we've got 2 times 24, uh, 3 times 16, 4 times 12, and we've got 6 times 8. Now we want to look and see where the largest square number is. So we've got the 1 there, we've got the 4, and we've got the 16. So the 16 is the largest square number. And so what we're going to do is we're going to rewrite the root 48. But instead of root 48, we want to split it up into square root 3, square root 16. But always put the square number first. So I'm going to write it as root 16 times root 3. Now square root of 16, the reason we put the square number first is we can actually square root that. Square root of 16 is obviously 4. So it becomes 4 times root 3. And with thirds, we don't actually write the time sign between the, um, an integer and the third. So it's just 4 root 3. The bottom of the fraction in the power tells us the root that we're going to do. And the top is just the power. So the top is just a normal power. But the bottom will tell us what root we're going to do. So I'm going to write out this fraction again. So 1 over 125. And I'm going to deal with that bottom first. So I'm going to leave that power of 2 on the outside. What that root is going to do is it's going to find the cube root of the numbers at the top and bottom. Now the cube root of 1 is just 1. And the cube root of 125 is 5. Now that power the 2 on the outside, what that's going to do is it's just going to put both of them to the power of 2. So 1 squared is going to be 1, and 5 squared is 25. If we count the squares for 0 to 10, we count that there are 8 squares. And to get from the frequency 4 to 8, we times by 2. And so each of these will be multiplied by 2 to find out how many squares there are. But we're actually going backwards because we're going to count how many squares there are and then we're going to try and work out the frequency. So for this second one, there are, well, there are 12 squares below this line. And then these two here are one square. These two half squares count as one. And these two count as one. So it's going to be 12 plus 2. 2 which is going to be 14 so 14 squares now to get from the frequency to the amount of squares we times by 2 so obviously the other way around we divide by 2 so that would be 7 and counting the next squares we're at 6 high and 2 across so that would be 12 and so we're going to divide by 2 to find out the answer is 6 so the frequencies are 7 and 6 you're expected to be able to draw a sine cosine and tangent wave um, and here we're asked to work out what y equals cos x looks like on a graph. Now cos x starts at 1, goes down to 0, then goes down to minus 1, 180, then back up to 0 at 270, 
then back up to one at 360. But don't just join it up with straight lines. That will not get you any marks. You've got to make it look like a wave. And this is not the easiest thing to do, but they are very forgiving over how you do this. As long as it goes through the points, and as long as this bottom bit is a U shape, and not a V shape, then normally you will get the mark. So, although that doesn't look perfect, that would definitely get the marks. So if the area of the rectangle is 10, and one of the lengths is root 75, to find the other length, we do the area divided by um, the length given, and that will work out what the other length is. Um, root 75, though, is something that can be simplified. So let's simplify that. And it's root 25, root 3. So it's 5 root 3. So this equals 10 over 5 root 3. Now notice top and bottom can be um, simplified. So that becomes 2 over root 3. And we're asked to rationalize the denominator. So we get times this by root 3 over root 3. And so we can end up with 2 root 3 over 3. So our answer is 2 root 3 over 3. When asked to simplify an algebraic fraction, you will almost always need to factorise either the numerator, the denominator, or both. On this question, we need to factorise both. Um, so I'm going to start off by factorising the top. Now you'll notice that this is a difference of two squares. This is nice and easy to factorise because it will be x plus 2 and x minus 2. And we've got loads of videos on how to identify and um, deal with difference of two squares if you don't know how to do that. Similarly, the bottom is just a simple quadratic. So we're just going to factorise that. Again, we've got videos on how to factorise um, quadratics. So have a look at those if you need to. Um, then we're going to look at top and bottom and see if there's a bracket that's the same, which there is, this x minus 2. So we're going to divide top and bottom by x minus 2, and that will effectively get rid of the x minus 2 at the top and the x minus 2 at the bottom. It won't get rid of it, it will just turn it to 1, and then it will be x plus 2 times 1 and 2x minus 3 times 1, uh, which will just be x plus 2 as the numerator and 2x minus 3 as the denominator. So we're told in the question that y is inversely proportional to the cube of x. So we can show that by y is, in, is proportional, there's proportionality, inversely, which would be 1 over the cube of x. Now con to convert that alpha, the, the proportionality symbol, into an equals, we need to introduce a constant to the right hand side. So we get y equals k over x cubed. And all I've done to the right hand side is multiplied it by k. Okay, now we need an instance where we know what y is when x is something. And here we do have that, or it should be the other way around. What y is, well, yeah, what y is when x is something. So we've got y is 10 and x is 7. So we're going to feed those numbers into this kind of equation that we've made. So it's going to be 10 equals k over 7 cubed, or 10 equals k over 343. Okay. And then we're going to multiply both sides by the 343. So times by 343, both sides find out what k is. And I'm just going to swap them around just to give myself a bit more space. And we're going to have k on the left hand side here. So that would be 3430. So k is 3430. So what I'm going to do is just rewrite this equation here. But we know what k is now. So it's y equals 3430 over x cubed. And that actually is our answer. So with all these circle theorem questions, there's multiple ways of doing it. I'm going to show you one way, but if you've got a different way and you get the right answer in correct methods, then please feel free to use that. Uh, first thing I'm going to notice is we've got a lot of tangents touching radii. So we've got two radii here and here. 
And whenever we've got a, a tangent touching a radius, um, it's always going to be 90 degrees. And so I'm just going to show these all on the diagrams 90 degrees. And then we're going to say angle OBC equals angle OBA equals angle ADO equals 90 degrees. And we have to show the reasons. Most of the marks in this question will be for the region, reason. So it's going to be a tangent radius equals 90 degrees. And try and write out the full um, reasons. I'm going to just keep it um, a little bit contained just so I can fit this um, answer all on the same slide. Okay, so the first thing I'm realizing is that there's a nice little quadrilateral here. And whenever we've got quadrilateral and we've got three of the sides, we can work out the last one. So angle DOB is going to be 360. Take away the angles that we know, so 90 plus 90 plus 48. And the reason for that is uh, angles in quadrilateral add up to 360 degrees. And so when you do 360, take away that, you get 132 degrees. So this is 132. But we also have this angle here, which is also angle DOB, but I'm going to call this kind of the reflex one. And to work this one out, we just do 360 take away 132. And the reason for that is angles on a point equal 360 degrees. And so we're going to do 360, take away 132, which is 228. So this is 228 degrees. Now we can also use the circle theorem to work out this one, um, because we've got an angle at the centre and an angle at the circumference. And the angle at the centre is twice the angle at the circumference. So angle D, F, B is going to be 132 divided by 2 angle at center twice angle at circumference okay so when we um, halve that so 132 and we're going to halve it so that's 66 degrees we should really put degrees on these okay the next one we're going to work out is this angle here which is angle O angle O B F um, there's no um, reason for this, it's just the, the whole thing is 90, we're taking away the 77, um, so that would be 13 degrees, so that's a nice easy one. And let's just put the 66 degrees on our diagram as well. And the final, um, final thing really here is that we've got a quadrilateral here, kind of arrowhead, and we've got three of the angles, one, two, three, and we're looking for the third one, so angle... Uh, ODF is going to be 360 take away um, all the angles that we know so the 228 the 13 and the 66 and the reason being uh, it's the same as before so angles in quadrilateral add up to 360 degrees and when you do that, you get the answer of 53 degrees. So this angle here is going to be 53 degrees. So the first thing to do is we want to find the roots from the sketch that we've got. And the roots are just where the graph crosses the x-axis. So we can see it crosses it here at minus 8. Crosses it here at 3. Crosses it here at 5. Now, what is special about roots? Well, roots are where the graph equals zero. It's where y is zero. And the only way to get to zero is for looking at this, is if one of these brackets is zero. So we're going to say, OK, well, let's have a look at the first one, x plus a. Let's get that equal to zero. Oh, equal to zero. Um, so we're going to put in the first root in there. We're going to say minus 8 plus a equals 0, add 8 both sides, 
a must equal 8. So if a equals 8, then the whole thing will equal 0. That's the first root done. Go do the same with the next one. x plus b equals 0. And this time um, the root is 3. So it's going to be 3 plus b equals 0. Take away 3 both sides. And you get b is minus 3. Then we're looking at the last one. x plus c. Look at the last root, which is 5. Oh, we're going to get it equal to 0. And then it's going to be 5 plus c equals 0. And take away 5 both sides. You get minus 5. And so if a is 8 b is minus 3 and c is minus 5, it means that at minus 8, 3 and 5, it will equal 0, which is what it does in our graph. Now you might say, well, why does a have to be equal 8? Why can't b equal 8? It can. These can be in any order. And so if I wrote these in the opposite order, minus 5, uh, 8 and minus 3, for instance, it would still be correct. I'm going to rewrite the question first of all. Whenever we've got a square on the outside of a bracket, it just means we're going to times the bracket by itself. Now the way we can expand this is very similar to the way we expand um, with quadratics. Now you might have a different method like FOIL or something else. Uh, I'm just going to do the grid method. It doesn't really matter which method you choose. So we're going to do uh, 11 and root 2 at the top, and 11 and root 2 down the side. So 11 times 11 is 121. 11 times root 2 is 11 root 2. We've got another 11 root 2 there. And then root 2 times root 2. When you times the numbers together, it's going to be root 4. And root 4 is 2. So that's just going to be 2. Add the numbers together. So 121 plus 2 is going to be 123 and then add the thirds together. So we've got 11 root 2 plus 11 root 2. So that's going to be 22 root 2. Compare it to the expression in the question, a plus b root 2. The a will be 123, and the b will be the 22. I'm going to start off this question by factorising the denominator of the first fraction. And so we've got 1 over... I'm going to factorise it. Now, if you want um, to see how to factorise it, you can see other videos we've got. I'm kind of assuming you know how to factorise this if you're watching this video. And just keep the second fraction the same. Now, you can't add fractions unless you have um, the same denominator. So, if you look at the first denominator, the only difference between the first and the second is that 8x plus 3. So I'm going to times top and bottom of the second fraction by 8x plus 3. Now it helps us to remember that, you know, technically that bottom uh, expression, the x plus 2, is in brackets. So I'm going to just copy down the same first fraction, because we're not really doing anything with that. And what I'm going to do is just times top and bottom by the 8x plus 3. 1 times 8x plus 3 is just 8x plus 3, and it should do it neatly, and we've got um, the 8x plus 3 times the bottom, which will just give us the same um, denominator. So now the denominators are the same, we can just add the numerators, so it's just going to be 1 plus 8x plus 3, or in other words it's going to be 8x plus 4, so it's 8x plus 4. And the bottom one is going to be 8x plus 3 and x plus 2. You can complete a unique version of this paper by going to our OnMath site. OnMath is full of free content to help you prepare for your exams, such as topic-based papers, demon questions and mini-mocks. If you like what we do, please consider subscribing.